understand, don't we, that the, the nations are gathered, are we there in Revelation 16, by three unclean spirits like frogs. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for three unclean spirits like frogs, which come out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. We understand what those powers are, don't we? The dragon, the eastern leg of the empire. We're, we're, we're looking there at the old Byzantine empire, the eastern side. The, the beast, we're looking at Europe. So, so the dragon power, we're seeing Russia heading up. The, the, the beast is Europe and the false prophet, the papacy. And, and these spirits are spirits of devils working miracles which go forth to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to battle. Now, now this section of scripture started in, in verse 12, where we read that the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up. Now, that's a useful reference point for us, because we understand, as Bible students have for many, many years, that the great river Euphrates drying up is the symbol of the drying up of the Ottoman, the Turkish Empire. And we use the symbol of the Euphrates because the Euphrates starts in Turkey. So when this river dries up, as a river does, it dries up to source, it's going to dry up to Turkey. And that's what we've seen happen. And, and we just should be very clear, this isn't a new idea. This isn't an idea that we're looking at in the 21st century. For hundreds of years, Bible students have understood verse 12 of Revelation 16 to be the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman power which has dried up. And that's happened. At the beginning of the last century, that the remnants of the Ottoman Empire really dried up. And so when we come to, to verse 13, verse 14, 15, 16, we're talking about our days. Because these spirits like frogs gather the nations to Armageddon. And Armageddon's not happened yet. So we can reference ourselves in these verses. Now, brothers and sisters, young people, children, where do we come across frogs in the Bible? Come on, children, tell me, come on. In Egypt, good boy. Where do we read about Egypt? Good boy. In the book of Exodus, you said, didn't you? Yes, come on, let's go there. Good boy. Come on. Here we go. So come with me to Exodus. Come to Exodus chapter 8. Where we're going to read about the frogs. Ugh, they say in Wales, that they don't say gross. They say achavi. Can you say achavi? No, you learn some Welsh today. See, we're learning. Right. Here we are. Exodus chapter 8. And we see in verse 3 that the river brings forth frogs abundantly. And these frogs come into your house, Moses talking to Pharaoh, to your bedchamber, on your bed, on the house of your servants, on your people, in your ovens, in your kneading troughs. They're going everywhere. And they're affecting everyone. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. It doesn't matter where you live. These frogs are going to affect you. And they do. The plague comes the end of that plague we read that the, 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 the frogs are brought out of the houses we read verse 11 they depart from you from your houses from your servants from your people they shall remain in the river only and Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh and Moses cried to the Lord because of the frogs which he brought against Pharaoh and the Lord did according to the word of Moses and the frogs died out of the houses out of the villages and out of the fields. And they gathered them together upon heaps and the land stank. Now we're going to come back here later. Brother Thomas, writing in 1848, made the point that the frogs are the symbol of the French democracy. 
suggested that the frogs that we read of in Revelation are the symbol of the French democracy. It's just interesting, isn't it, that we saw in Revelation chapter 11 in our first talk on the street, on the street of France, we believe, that's the street of the great city, which is called spiritually Sodom and Egypt. All right. We, we, we just saw a connection there. I wonder if any of you know where this place is. Anyone any idea? Lords? Notre Dame Cathedral? So, so the answer is um, no. <laughs> so, so what do you say there? Reims. All right. So, uh, you know, I'm ta- my wife keeps telling me, she says, you keep saying it wrong. It's not Reims. It's, she says it's Reims. Uh, you say Reims. Right. So, so here we are in Reims. The, the, uh, Understand, brother, when you say Reem, why you say it, right? But apparently it's Reims Cathedral and the palace there, just go back, this palace, de Tau, all right? Now, this is a significant place in France because in this palace, next to, to Reims Cathedral, hangs this banner. And this banner dates back to Clovis, king of the Franks, the first king of the Franks. And Clovis, when he went into battle, had a particular banner that he would hold up. And on that banner are three frogs. All right. So so we're just interested to see this connection back to the first king of the Franks of three frogs. We we, we read of Clovis that uh, in 496, Clovis, king of the Franks, converted to Catholicism. His conversion was important because it helped establish Catholic dominance in Western Europe. It's interesting uh, uh, when we look at the history of Revelation. So so here's the the Merovingian kings, which Clovis was the first. Uh, And here's some of the banners or, or the symbols coming out of this era. The heraldic symbol of the Frankish Merovingian dynasty of kings was three frogs. In the 6th century, Clovis united the Frankish tribes under one ruler. He was the first house to rule the whole of Europe after the fall of the Roman Empire. The history of France starts with Clovis. When we read he united the Frankish tribes, which era is this in biblical history? It's the barbarians. It's the ten horns, right? The Frankish tribes. So this guy is of great significance, king of the Franks. He was the first king of the Franks to unite all the Frankish tribes under one ruler. Uh, Clovis is important in the historiography of France as the first king of what would become France. And we note again the significance of his conversion to Catholicism. This barbarian, who was an Arian in his beliefs, converts to Catholicism and to the thoughts around the Trinity. The consequent birth, after Clovis, some hundreds of years later, Charlemagne's alliance with the Bishop of Rome began. The consequent birth of the early Holy Roman Empire. Now you go to France today, and I've been to that cathedral, and you go to numerous buildings in France, and what you see are three words above the public buildings. They are liberty, equality, fraternity. The, 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 the great phrase that came out of the French Revolution. I wonder if you know who this man is. I guess the answer to that is we're not sure uh, or, 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 or simply no, right? This man here, this man is of great significance. He, uh, he was a French Jew. He was born in the 1800s and he, uh, in France, grew up in France. He fought in the First World War. He was a brilliant man. We're not surprised to hear, are we, as a, as a Jew? And he was tasked as a lawyer during the Second World War, particularly just after, beginning at the end of the Second World War and just after, with drawing up a major document that's used through the world today. And that document, 
Here's uh, Eleanor Roosevelt with this document. It is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the UDHR. And that man was René Cassin. René Cassin. And René Cassin, this brilliant Jew, brought up in this time in France, was given this task to pull together documents that exist in the world to create this legal framework of the UDHR. And it's interesting, brothers and sisters, friends, young people, that it's 70 years this year that that document was written. And so while Christadelphians are looking at the state of Israel and doing public lectures, on the state of Israel being established for 70 years, much of the world isn't in the least bit interested. They're interested in this, the UDHR, established now for 70 years. In fact, René Kassan is called the father of the Declaration of Human Rights. Now, how did he write it? How did this man write this document? Well, we're told he did this. First of all, let me just read this. He played a decisive role in drawing up the 1948 Declaration. It's interesting, by the way, a Canadian was also highly involved in the drawing up of this document. René Cassin presented a preliminary draft of the UDHR on the 16th of June, which was adopted as a working basis. Now look at this. It can be seen that his preliminary draft included the entire contents of the 1789 French Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen. Are you following? Let's get this clear in our minds. The three frog-like spirits, those, that symbol is used to get our minds on France. Because the frog-like spirits date all the way back to Clovis, King of the Franks. The frog-like spirits then come through. You know, in Britain, it's a joke to talk about the French rudely as frogs, right? Uh, and often it goes down to the fact that, that they like eating frogs' legs. But, but the point is, it's, it's a sort of rude joke in Britain to talk of the French as frogs. So you talk about this in Britain, no one has to sort of have a jump of the imagination. The French, right, the frogs, right? And here we are seeing the frog-like spirit coming through the spirit of the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen. So the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the UDHR, used today by world governments and particularly by the United Nations, is based on the earthquake of Revelation chapter 11, the events of Revelation chapter 16. It's about the frog like spirits. You know, the UN website will tell you, international human rights law will tell you the history. The history is the traditional categorization of three generations of human rights, liberty, equality, fraternity, used in both national and international human rights discourses, traces it back to the echo of the cry of the French Revolution, liberty, equality and fraternity. So, brethren and sisters, young people, friends, we're interested this afternoon to look carefully, just for a few moments, at France. What's happening in this nation? And what we're seeing, aren't we, is a president, Macron, who is playing his part significantly in world events. How France's president made his mark on the world stage, this BBC article says. And what they say is, if we look at his speech to the UN General Assembly, last year, by the way, this speech was completely focused on human rights. Macron says, France is back at the core of Europe. What has he got to say about it? He says, I want to build a more sovereign, united and democratic Europe. This is the spirit of the French Revolution, right? 
We will never build something sufficiently ambitious at 27. That's interesting. Right? Maybe he wants to have 10, for example. If some people are ready to be more ambitious, to go further in terms of integration ambition, of what makes you sovereign as a power in this global environment, to defend your values and your interests, let's move, says Macron. He speaks to the, the Council of Europe. He goes to visit them. And this is his speech to the, the, the French Republic in the European Court of Human Rights. And this is what he says. He says, the Declaration of the Rights of Man of the Citizen of 1789 is, of course, the main wellspring of these principles, that the principles of human rights. However, its roots lie even deeper in the ground of Renaissance humanism, in the legacy of antiquity, in the concept of the human being that France has constructed over the centuries, since the time of Clovis. The human rights proclaimed during the French Revolution then subsequently reaffirmed time and again and reinterpreted, Macron says, by the great minds and statesmen of our country are an integral part of this core identity which goes back a very long way. It's not insignificant, he says, that the UDHR was adopted in Paris in 1948. Rest assured, for us, the French, this is of the utmost significance. This year, Emmanuel Macron was awarded the Charlemagne Prize. Now, the Charlemagne Prize is awarded by the people of Aachen in northwest Germany following the events of the Second World War. And they give this prize to somebody in the world that they believe has had an impact in uniting Europe. In 2016, Pope Francis was given this award. In 2018, the award was given to Emmanuel Macron. Look what they say. Is he the new Napoleon? A Napoleon for the 21st century, they say. I feel like the angels are working to get our minds on the great earthquake of Revelation chapter 11. Now, what's of real interest to us, brothers and sisters, young people and friends, is that the Pope, instead of asking people to look at Israel, which is the great witness of the hope of Israel, as we've considered today in our times, he asked people on the 70th anniversary to get focused on the UDHR the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Now, isn't that extraordinary? Because think back to the French Revolution. Back at the time of the French Revolution, Napoleon and co, and all of the, 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 the systems that came out of the French Revolution, the papacy was utterly opposed to. They hated what the French Revolution stood for. for they hated it. And now they've come full circle. From rejection to proclamation, the de development of the Catholic Church's thinking on human rights. And so now he's saying, I want you to use the UDHR. The modern understanding, he says, of human rights coed perfectly with the Christian view. Referring to President Trump's recent and widely criticised decision to recognise Jerusalem as the capital of Israel... He said that the status quo must prevail. He says that Ju the status quo of Jerusalem must be settled on the universal declaration of human rights. It should be a two-state solution. It's not a new thing, what he's talking about. In fact, this is in the catechism of the Catholic Church for decades. For decades, the Catholic Church has spoken... And you can't read this, so you'll have to look at it afterwards, right? For decades, they've spoken about the importance of aligning themselves with human rights. After the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, blessed 
John the 13th, that, that, that Pope and his successors have developed the church's social doctrine in the area of human rights. The Catholic Church is continuously developing way has made the reference of human dignity by the protection of human rights, the principal focus of its social role in the contemporary world. It's not possible to be a church in these times, the Catholic Church says, without a concerted plan for dealing with human rights. And look at this. When as Christians, the Catholics say, we fight for justice and for human rights, for a compassionate and caring society, we're acting specifically in the name of the Trinity. We've come full circle. What did Clovis do, the barbarian? He was baptised, wasn't he, into Catholicism. He adopted the idea from an Arian belief, a belief in one God, to the belief of the Trinity, the frog like spirits. And brethren and sisters, let me just give us a word of warning. We're seeing in the brotherhood today all sorts of ecclesias, of brothers and sisters, too focused on trying to create social programs to fix the world's problems today. We're seeing ecclesias too worried about trying to hand out sleeping bags bringing people in for soup kitchens. It is not our role. Our role is to preach this word. If someone needs help, of course you help them. Of course you do. If someone walks into our lecture and is hungry, you feed them. But our role is to preach the word. We don't want to get caught up in the thinking of the papacy. Thank you, brother. We'll take that. Amen. All right. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights, this document. Do you know what they say? Do you know what they say? It's this spirit, isn't it? That we understand from Revelation chapter 16, the frog-like spirits that is used today, that spirit is going to be used to bring the nations to Armageddon. Right? We understand that from Revelation 16. Now, what does the world say? Israel is the number one human rights violator. That is extraordinary, isn't it? When you think of the regimes across the world, the United Nations say the number one, the worst of the lot, is Israel. Israel slams the sham of the United Nations Human Rights Council after five new anti-Israel resolutions this year. As a result, the US, which had warned they would quit the UNHRC, the UN Human Rights Council, if they didn't address the bias towards Israel, they have quit. Nikki Haley said, the council is a protector of human rights abusers that targets Israel and ignores atrocities elsewhere. And then, of course, there is the matter of the chronic bias against Israel. Last year, the United States made it clear that we would not accept the continued existence of Agenda Item 7, which singles out Israel in a way that no other country is singled out. Earlier this, earlier this year, as it has in previous years, the Human Rights Council passed five resolutions against Israel, more than the number passed against North Korea, Iran, and Syria combined. This disproportionate focus and unending hostility towards Israel is clear proof that the Council is motivated by political bias, not by human rights. For all these reasons, the United States spent the past year engaged in a sincere effort to reform the Human Rights Council. And they failed. If you think about the nations of the world in the UN, those nations are made up predominantly of Muslim nations and of Catholic nations. And those nations will gather together against Israel. We're interested to see 
that following that, the UK, now we'd expect this, wouldn't we, from what our brother Matt has spoken to us about today, we expect to see the UK standing with uh, the, the, the likes of the, well, the Commonwealth nations, the Young Lions and Sheba and Didan, and those nations we expect to, to not be so aggressive in their uh, rhetoric against Israel. So the UK's put UN Human Rights Council on notice over its anti-Israel bias. Britain condemns Israel bias at the UN Rights Council. The, the, the Foreign Secretary at the time, he's gone now, uh, Boris Johnson, spoke about the anti-Israel bias in the Human Rights Council. And so uh, he gave the UNHRC six months to cease in anti-Israel bias or Britain would come out. Now, obviously, Boris Johnson's no longer the Foreign Secretary, but we're interested, aren't we, to see these things. Critics slam the UN Human Rights Council election of unqualified new members. The new members of the council, well, for many of them, Bahrain, Cameroon, the Philippines, Somalia, Bangladesh and Eritrea have got horrific human rights records and yet they're welcomed onto the council because the angels are working. Because this is the spirit which will gather the nations to Armageddon. And what is the great bugbear? The great bugbear of this council is the fact that Israel is in the land, and particularly the land that they occupied from 67. The land that they took when the, the Six Day War took place, and of course they, they, over, they, they overwhelmed the, the Arab armies that came against them, and they took Judah, Jerusalem. They, 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 they've taken huge parts uh, of the land back. So for half a century, Amnesty International said, Israel's occupation of the West Bank, including East Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip, has resulted in systematic human rights violations against Palestinians living there. Now, brothers and sisters, come to Ezekiel 36, and young people and friends. Come with me to Ezekiel chapter 36. Brother Matt has focused our minds today, hasn't he, on Ezekiel chapter 38. So we want to just see a prophecy before the king of the north comes down in Ezekiel 38, what would we expect to see happen? Ezekiel 36 is a prophecy against the mountains of Israel. When we read in Ezekiel 38 of the king of the north coming down, where did the king of the north come down to in Israel? On the mountains, right? The king of the north has got an issue the confederacy of nations with what Israel is doing on the mountains of Israel. Ezekiel 36, look at verse 1. It's a prophecy to the mountains of Israel. Now the mountains of Israel is a specific area in the land. Here it is on the screen. It's the territory that we now call the West Bank. So young people, when you read the mountains of Israel, you can have a note in there that says West Bank. That is the territory of Ezekiel 36. The mountains of Israel is a prophecy against the West Bank. Now, what do we read? Verse 8. You, O mountains of Israel, you shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people of Israel, for they are at hand to come. Well, they've come, haven't they? Behold, I'm for you, and I'll turn unto you, and you will be tilled and sown. Agriculture will develop on the mountains of Israel, and I will multiply men on you. All the house of Israel, even all of it. And the cities shall be inhabited, and the waste shall be built. I will multiply on you man and beast, and they shall increase and bring fruit. And I will settle you after your old estates, and you will do better than you uh, and will do better unto you than at your beginnings. Then you shall know that I am Yahweh. What have we seen happen on the mountains of Israel? We've seen settlement after settlement. And what's so extraordinary is that in this neck of the woods, in this part of the world, North America, We've seen, haven't we, someone come into the White House and totally change the world policy or the American policy toward Israel. In December 2016, 
One of the last things that Barack Obama did in office was abstain from voting in the United Nations Council. And because he abstained from the resolution 2334, it was passed. Normally, America votes against anything that's to do with Israel. On this occasion, the last thing, one of the last things he did in office, he abstained from the vote. And as a result, resolution 2334 was passed, which said, Israel, under international law, under the spirit of the frogs, must stop building in the West Bank. And in January, Obama left office. And the angels worked very hard. And Trump was brought into office because the God of all the earth, the God of the universe, he rules over the nations and he gives it to whomsoever he will to bring about his purpose. And Trump's policy toward Israel is very different than Obama's. Emboldened by Trump, Israel keeps building. How Israel boosted its settlement program after Trump's election victory. Is it extraordinary? Ezekiel 36 says, I will multiply men on you on the West Bank before gold comes down. And the world's policy says you've got to stop building. You've got to stop building. This is unacceptable. The United Nations say, we're going to, resolution 2334, you stop building in this area. You're you're against international law. We call upon all nations to stop you. And God says, OK, well, we've got to change direction. And Trump's brought in and they keep building. Ezekiel 36 is happening before our eyes. This is the summer. Israel approves plans for a thousand settlement homes. This article is from September. Israel illegal settlement construction more than doubled in 2018. I will multiply men on you. This is October. Israel approves six million dollars expansion of Hebron Jewish settlement. Israeli settlers take over abandoned West Bank army base, establishing an illegal outpost. October the 28th. What are we? Are we this week? Do you know what Brother Thomas said? It may be remarked here. I love the understatement. It may be remarked here that there will have been a considerable gathering of Israelites upon the mountains of Israel before the invasion of the country by Gog. 150 years ago, that brother, in reading Ezekiel 36, was able to say categorically that there would be a gathering of Israelites upon the West Bank before the invasion of the country by Gog. And so the settler population keeps rising. This is the, 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 set, the red line is the settlement population in Israel. The exponential line here, the blue line, is the West Bank. And the world is furious. 50 years, they say, of occupation abuses. They quote... Israel's systematic abuses of the Palestinians' population's rights, at least five categories of major violations of international human rights law, humanitarian law, characterise the occupation. It's the frog-like spirits. Human Rights Watch, draw out for us. And the United Nations keep having reports back. This is uh, in October, just two weeks ago. The, the, the special reporter on the, uh, on, on the Middle East comes and he speaks to the UN. He says the grave situation in Gaza demands decisive action. The special coordinator for the Middle East peace process tells the Security Council, urging the end of occupation. In his briefing, Mr. Eldad spoke of outrage, indignity and pain of Palestinians who he said have been denied their human rights for more than half a century. He urged member states to let Israel know they will no longer stand idly by. Act, he says to them, 
do something about it. And you know, at the end of what he had to say, all the nations of the world are given opportunity to speak. Now, if I tell you that if you look at the UN website regularly, you will know that when um, a point is being made by anyone bringing any information, at the end of their speech, normally seven or eight nations will stand up and have something to say on it. This is Israel, though. And we know that all nations will be gathered. And so we see a list. At the end of that speech last week, all of these nations had something to say on the actions of Israel in undermining the UDHR. They want them out of the occupied territories, as they would call them. Young people, brothers and sisters, friends, why is Vietnam interested in Israel? Why is Namibia bothered about Israel? Why is Equatorial Guinea bothered about Israel? I'll tell you why. Because the God of all the earth says that all nations will come against this place. The UN human rights expert urges action to stop Israel's annexation in the West Bank. This is this week. What does he say? Let me show you what he says. The 24th of October, 2018, a UN human rights expert said, it was high time the international community takes firm action to stop Israel's annexation of large parts of the West Bank through settlement expansion and legislative in in initiatives, warning that failure to do so will likely prompt Israel to formalize annexation into domestic law. You're too late, pal. We'll come to that in a minute. During five decades of the occupation, Israel has steadily entrenched its sovereign footprint throughout the West Bank. The special reporter on the situation of human rights in the occupied Palestinian territory said, the reporter urged the international community to act, do something about it, he says. Despite Israel's record of non-compliance with the directions of the international community, it has rarely paid a meaningful price for its defiance, and its appetite for entrenching its annexation ambitions has gone largely unchecked. Do something about it, he's urging the nations. We're not surprised. We're not surprised. Because we understand, don't we, that the frog-like spirits will gather the kings of the earth and of the whole world to battle. We understand from Joel chapter 3, I will gather all nations and bring them to the valley of judgment. We understand from Zechariah chapter 12, in that day will I make Jerusalem a burns and stone for people. That all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. I will make Jerusalem a burden of some stone. And so 2018, Jerusalem needed to come to the fore. Trump, again, you can always rely on him, can't you, right? Jerusalem is Israel's capital. <laughs> As I said in December, our greatest hope is for peace. The United States remains fully committed to facilitating a lasting peace agreement. While presidents before him have backed down from their pledge to move the American embassy once in office, this president delivered. Because when President Trump makes a promise, he keeps it. The truth is that Jerusalem has been and will always be the capital of the Jewish people, the capital of the Jewish state. May the opening of this embassy in this city spread the truth far and wide, and may the truth advance a lasting peace between Israel and all our neighbors. 
God bless the United States of America, and God bless Jerusalem. So, Revelation 16, come back there. Which, what was it that the frog-like spirits came out of? Came out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. It's interesting to see who's got something to say on the actions of Trump. Putin, the dragon, deeply concerned by Trump's Jerusalem move. What does he say? He says that Moscow believes that the status of Jerusalem should be settled through talks between the Palestinians and Israel in line with the frog-like spirits. In line with the United Nations resolutions. This is Putin. He doesn't give a monkey's about what the United Nations has got to say on something. If he wants to take Crimea, he'll take Crimea. If he wants to move into Ukraine, he'll move into Ukraine. We've been shown today. But out of his mouth, we're told, will come this spirit where he calls the world to be in line with the UN resolutions. It will come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the, the, the beast. The UN and the European Union criticised Trump's Jerusalem announcement. And the Pope, the false prophet, Pope Francis, urges world leaders to respect the UN position on Jerusalem. And no sooner has the dust settled, on what they did in May, in moving the embassy to Jerusalem. And by the way, other nations are quietly following suit. But what's of real interest is that literally within two months, Israel, emboldened by what they, they can do with the backing of America, pass their nation-state law. Now this is after a decade of political wrangling and explosive acrimonious debate this most contentious of laws was never going to pass quietly the board had signaled that the Jewish state law had passed by seven votes furious Arab members of parliament tore up copies of the bill as they shouted apartheid and right wing is ready legislation as one protesting MP was removed by security Ayman Ode leader of the mostly Arab joint list party symbolically held up a black flag over the bill. A black flag, he said, hovers over this evil law. The bill describing Israel for the first time as the national home of the Jewish people has far-reaching implications prompting accusations that the most hardline right-wing government in Israel's history is formally codifying racism. So today we have made a law in stone. This is our country, this is our language, this is our anthem and this is our flag. Long live the state of Israel. Imagine the Pioneer Brothers seeing this take place in the last few months, are our eyes open to watching this? Guess what they have to say? The EU, the beast, leads criticism after Israel passes the Jewish nation state law. Why? Could you just about make this out? The respect for human rights and fundamental principles are a key part of the EU Israel partnership. They're not happy. Russia, the dragon, the Jewish state law greatly complicates Middle East peace. The false prophet, what do they say in this article? Have a look here. Disregarding human rights. We live in extraordinary time. Even the UN, we're not surprised, are we? Because that's the body where the nations are gathered. Voices concern over Israel's Jewish nation-state law. Look what they have to say. We reaffirm the United Nations' respect for the sovereignty of states to define their constitutional character while emphasising the need for all states to adhere to the frog 
like spirits. Israel's nation state law has 11 major points. We, we're going to, time's gone, right? We're going to deal with three very quickly. Very, very quickly. Don't panic. The law does three major things. It establishes Jewish settlements as a national value. We've seen that in our talk this afternoon, haven't we? That's what they do. They keep building. And now it's enshrined in law that we can keep settling. The name of the state is Israel. Now, you know, we might say, well, we, we call it Israel. It's now in law. The name of the state is Israel. And Jerusalem, it's complete and united capital. And it establishes Hebrew as Israel's official language. How are these things in the last few months? How are they signs of the times to us today? Well, when uh, Palestinian writers talk of the al-Nakba, the, the destruction, the catastrophe of 1948, which is how they refer to it in their history of the Jews coming into the land. Well, what they say is that they were supplanted. We we have been supplanted by Jewish Zionist colonists being hurled at us from other parts of the world. Look, we're, we're being supplanted by the settlements uh, coming up in the land of Israel. There are maps showing the Palestinian villages erased and replaced, which is what the word supplanted means, isn't it, with Jewish towns. This article by this uh, particular uh, writer a journalist goes to meet him, and he goes to meet this Palestinian writer. He says, when I met with him in Jerusalem last month, Rubinstein told me that he once asked a Palestinian acquaintance, of all those who conquered you, the Crusaders, the Mamluks, the Turks, who was the best and who was the worst? The reply, I don't know who the best was, but I know you're the worst, meaning the Israelis. How can that be, the journalist says. After all, you've got a master's degree here. You get a pension. You've got a good life. To which the Palestinian said, true, all the others came to enslave us. You came to supplant us. Why is that interesting to us? The time of Jacob's trouble. The time of the supplanter's trouble. He will be saved out of it. And he will no more be called Jacob, but Israel. It's a sign of the times. The nation state law says we are to be called Israel. What else? Well, you can see, uh, we can tick off that. We can tick off this one. Uh, he, it establishes Hebrew as Israel's official language. Come to Zephaniah chapter 3. Nearly there, brothers and sisters. Come to Zephaniah chapter 3. Young people, you are extraordinarily patient. Well done. Go and see a lovely sister afterwards for some cookies or something like that. Don't come to me. You're going to be brutally disappointed. Zephaniah chapter 3. What do we read? Verse 9. I will turn to the people a pure language. Is it interesting that Hebrew is now the established language under law in the state of Israel? Now, obviously, Zephaniah chapter 3 talks of things still to come. Talks of things still to come. Yet the seeds are in place, aren't they, of that language. Now, just look at the context of it. Go back to verse 8. Therefore, wait ye upon me, says the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to... Gather the nations. What did he do in Babel? He scattered the nations. That I may assemble the kingdoms. What did he want to do in Babel? He wanted to disperse the kingdoms. To bring them to a pure language. What did he do in Babel? He confounded them. He confused the languages. Right? So Zephaniah chapter 3 is the reversal of Babel. It's the collapse of that system. Exodus chapter 8. I told you we started. We've got to go back. Come on. Exodus chapter 8. We're nearly there. The nations are to be gathered together. Frog-like spirits gather the nations together, don't they? To Armageddon. What does Armageddon mean? A heap of sheaves 
in a valley of threshing, a heap of sheaves in a valley of threshing. We're back in Exodus chapter 8. What happens to the frogs? We read verse 13, 14. They gathered them together. What's this language? They gathered them together. We've seen it time and again, haven't we? Of the nations that are gathered. Why are they gathered together? Because the frog-like spirits gather them together. They're gathered together. And they're gathered together upon heaps. And the land stank. A heap of sheaves in a valley of threshing. Do you know, we we read the end of verse 14, that the land stank. Well, Matt earlier took us to Ezekiel chapter 39. I don't want you to turn there. Our time is gone. Verse 11, where we read of the graves following the destruction by the Lord Jesus Christ and the saints on the Gogian Confederacy. And we read that after that, that people that coming through the land have to stop their noses. Why? Because the land stinks here. The frogs are heaped up. The land, this is what will happen by the Lord Jesus Christ and the saints. Finally, that word heaps in the Hebrew is given a double emphasis. They gather them together upon heaps heaps. Now that is the word, does anyone remember where we started today? The mortar of Babel. You see, brethren and sisters, young people and friends, we live in the days when these things are coming to pass every day if we're prepared to look at the news. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back to the earth quickly and so we challenge ourselves are we ready israel are back in the land the king of the north is prepared britain has left is leaving the system of europe and the frog-like spirits have gone out what else are we waiting for come out of her my people the call goes up and let's make sure that in the days that remain to us we walk forward in faith looking For a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God.